Viewer discretion is advised. It's a beautiful, beautiful, clear day. Clear skies, really hot in the African bush. And welcome, this is Safari Live. and welcome to Safari Love. My name is Byron and on camera with me this afternoon is Brian, the BNB team back together again and the Thumb. Good afternoon Thumb. And on the other vehicle we've got James and Jandre and then on Bushwalk this afternoon Jamie and VM. So full house, hopefully we're going to be finding lots of animals and lots of interesting little creatures to look at. We also have Jerry and Rebecca in the FC as always. Now I hope you're all having a great day and a great start to the weekend. It's a very, very warm day, about 31 degrees Celsius or about 86 degrees Fahrenheit, somewhere around there. Very hot. It actually feels a lot warmer than that, I must be honest. So our plan for this afternoon is we're going to be driving around and checking water holes, just like this one off to my left. And we're going to see if we can potentially find any animals going down to drink. There's nothing here at the moment. But we've just got started, so we will see and try our best. Hopefully we find some elephant. I've been looking for a nice herd of elephant for the last few days, or last few weeks, two weeks or so. Um, and they've just been moving around a lot more because there's a lot of food and vegetation and water all over because of all the rain that we've had. So they haven't needed to be in one specific area. They've been um, kind of just moving and uh, uh, what's the word? Um, oh dear, I've had a blank now. Dispersing. Dispersing over the area. Word of the day, Brian. <laughs> I think I might uh, do a, a word of the day every day. <laughs> we'll, we'll, think of, we'll think of something every day and we'll see, see what everyone thinks. Um, please don't forget everyone, send us your questions and your comments. We are live, so everything you send we get immediately, maybe a few second delay, and then we're able to answer them for you. You can send them via Twitter at hashtag Safari Live, otherwise email us questions at wildearth.tv and all of us will try and answer your questions and see what we can all learn together on our safari. And we had an exciting morning. There were lions around. We managed to find the Unkahuma pride. All the, 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 well, the whole pride was together. All the females, five females and the six cubs. They're all looking fit and healthy, which is great. And then um, uh, Brent and James uh, managed to find Karula, uh, the beautiful female leopard that is basically the... I'd, I'd say the, not quite the alpha female, there isn't a, a thing like that with leopards, but she's the most dominant leopard in this area, female leopard in this area. That we, we tend to see her fairly regularly and her cubs. They had a kill in a tree not far from camp in the, those beautiful clearings outside of camp. But uh, I think she's taken the, the kill down into the drainage line, possibly a bit too busy. Um, but I'm sure James and Jamie will try and find her this afternoon. And speaking of Jamie, let's cross over to her now on a bushwalk. And a very good afternoon to all of you and welcome on the walk po portion of this sunset safari. My name is Jamie and this afternoon I have Viam on camera with me and Aubrey heading out in front of us keeping an eye on what's happening around us and of course acting as a spotter extraordinaire. Now, oh, being on foot of course is one of the best ways to experience life out here and wildlife out here. Uh, it does sometimes help if you remember where sightings are because this morning on our 
our way home. We'd heard the, the sort of the search for Karula and the fact that there was a an impala kill in a tree on quarantine. And we didn't quite realize exactly what side of quarantine she was on. So as we walked home, um, James had just finished off for the morning and we were slightly, we were quite far away so we had quite a long way to walk home and Eggsy and myself and Aubrey were wandering along all of a sudden Aubrey looks down and there's the drag mark from the Impala and I looked up and I don't know about 70 odd meters away there was Karula in the tree looking at me like she'd been waiting for us the entire time. James must have just just missed out on seeing her. She'd obviously just arrived and then I looked even closer and there was little Shungile sitting primly up at the top of the branches. These are leopards by the way for any of our new viewers. So one of those wonderful moments on bushwalk It's one of the reasons why I love being out on foot and of course Karula is a magic leopard on foot She doesn't run away. She doesn't get angry or anything like that She just watches you carefully sees what you're doing It helped that it was nice and open between us So she'd seen us coming from a long way away Heard all of our chats as we were heading home Listened to whatever we nonsense we were talking about and watched us in her way And then I looked up and she went oh yes, you've noticed me that was the expression on her face. Yes, I've been here the whole time watching you. And I was, it was so funny because I was about to say to Aubrey, you know, that's, that squirrel's gone completely crazy. It's chattering away. Then I realized the squirrel had actually seen two leopards. Now, as, when I, after we got back, let's, let's carry on. I'm going to try and find ourselves a slightly more shady patch because it is relatively hot this afternoon. So we're going to start walking towards the drainage line or the river systems of this area where there's some bigger trees. Um, when we when we got back, we immediately took final control and Alex and Eggsy back out to go and see the leopards in the tree. And Hosanna was not with them. And we actually found his tracks crossing away from this area. He was going towards, almost towards Treehouse Dam, actually. Uh, I don't know whether or not he's made his way back. We watched her for a while. She was calling for him. Um, I don't know whether or not they got separated or if he just is doing what young leopards do best, which is showing growing forms of of independence by constantly moving you know moving a little bit further and further afield so who knows hopefully fingers crossed um, Hosanna has made him his way back towards mom and his sister Shungile but without any further ado I heard that James was looking for them let's head over to him for a nice surprise this afternoon no, no. Good afternoon everybody and welcome to the Karula sighting. There is Karula, the great queen of Juma. I'm just going to quickly turn down the game drive radio which is so loud in my ear that I truly feel like my brain is going to explode. I'm okay now. Now, as Jamie was saying, we saw these two this morning. We also saw Hosanna, but not with them. And jean and I found a few baboons um, earlier, and we think maybe they came in between the slot. Maybe they chased them again and split them up. Hosanna was actually on the same drainage line, but quite a long way down that way, probably about half a mile down to the sort of south, down the stream as it were. So I don't know if they came past him on their way up here. I doubt it. I think he would have followed them. I think she will go back and look for the little male very shortly or at some stage, probably tonight. Now, they did kill something and she's looking directly towards the kill and Jandre made a very good point as we got in here. That, of course, is a very rare occurrence that Jandre should make a good point. He is on camera, everybody. Well done, Jandre, for making a good point. And his good point was that she's unhoisted the kill. So she put it into this big jackalberry tree to the right-hand side that very nice shady tree under which we're sitting now. She put it in there, but she's now moved it down onto a termite mound to the left-hand side. And Jandre's relatively good point was, why on earth would she take it out of a perfectly good tree and leave it there? And I think the answer is that because it's so small, I don't think it's, you know, conveniently easy to hook into any of the boughs of the tree. So there's a male impala, they often will hook the, the horns in between the boughs or in a fork, where something that little is often quite difficult to do. And because it's so easy to sort of cat handle, if you like, <laughs> you like that, John? No, you didn't like that. Um, cat handle, man handle. Um, I think it's easier just to eat it on the ground and it's so small that I think they'll probably finish it fairly soon. It's not impossible that Hosanna is around here somewhere, but I think he'd be eating actually if he was. So 
let's just sit here for a while and we'll see what happens and maybe later on we'll go and have a look. I'm just going to quickly call this in on the Game Drive channel. Stations relocated to Kurula and one youngster still to the western side of quarantine. Best, and best approach is to come on the western track that goes west of quarantine and then you will find tracks going west from there about 300 meters from the junction with Vuitella access. Animals are static. Now, of course that should be enough, but whether or not anyone would have heard me. And there is the Queen herself. Now, Brent's father, who is um, a fine naturalist himself, after we discussed the panting of leopards today, Remember, they pant after they eat, and I said it was for two reasons. One, the diaphragm has pushed up against the lungs, and so it's difficult for them to, to breathe because the stomach is so full. Then, I said also, of course, there's a huge amount of oxygen needed to absorb the nutrients, and Brent's father, thankfully, didn't disagree with anything I, anything I said, but he said... Uh, I should, and, I, and I quote here, one of the reasons in addition to what you said is a factor called heat increment. This is the heating effect resulting from digesting meat and the active and therefore energies involved, absorbing of the broken down nutrients and as you would expect anything that involves the expending of energy produces extra heat as a byproduct and therefore needs to be lost and as these predators can't sweat they need to pant to lose the energy of them. Basically what he said, and he was an animal scientist in his day of course, now he's a businessman, but that the, the action of digestion creates metabolic heat and that heat they have to get rid of. As we know, the cats, just like the dogs, do not have any kind of sweat glands. And so what happens is they must pant in order to get rid of that extra metabolic heat. Isn't that nice information? So you see it comes from all quarters, the information, and that's courtesy of Mr. K, Leo Smith, father of Mr. BLS. Marvellous. Now, the other thing I wanted to say about this leopard, totally disconnected to the panting, she's obviously got four spots there on the left hand, her left, our right, yes, just behind that leaf. And if you don't know what I mean, I will explain this to you a little bit later. Hashtag Safari Life, question to Wild Earth TV. if you've got any questions for us. Terms and conditions apply, battery's not included. And if you go to the other side, which uh, she's not showing us now, We've always said that she's got three spots there, and I was looking at some photographs of her the other day. And on her right and our left, she's actually got four spots. There's a very light one there. And while I doubt she'll ever be known as the 4-4 female, that is what she is. There are the three. You see one, two, three, just behind the nostril there. And if you look just above and between the first two, there's a very faint little spot there. I don't know how that or why that's been sort of discounted in pretty much the same place that the fourth spot is on the other side. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you can see four spots there just above the whisker line and those are used to identify a leopard. I mean, obviously we know Karula from a thousand different ways, from the wow written across the front of her forehead, just to the look of her face, to the colour of her, her pelage, her coat, to the slightly, uh, dare I say it, saggy uh, skin around her belly. But she's, I mean, she's got a hundred different ways that we identify this wonderful, wonderful leopard who so kindly shares her life with us. Isn't that marvellous? And then little Shongis, also hot, bothered, digesting food, trying to escape the flies. I think we'll probably sit here for about 20 minutes. Of course, these are two of our favourite characters in the whole world. And so even though they are flat and not doing a great deal, we'll sit with them for a little while. And then we might go off and see if we can find Hosanna and see what he's doing. We did struggle to find him again this morning, but we can do a little walk through the drainage line and see if we can't find him. Aaron, that's a really interesting comment from you. You say, <laughs> looking at Karula and Shungile, it's like looking at Karula and her mini-me. You think that they look very similar. 
I tend to agree with you, Aaron, and I, but were you to say the same about Hosanna, I would say no. I actually think that um, Shongila is starting to look quite a lot like Shadow, interestingly. She's got that kind of... Um, it's a, it's not a, it's not a, it's quite a severe look to her to her face. Shadow looks quite severe, and Shongile, although still imminently cute, especially when she's doing things like that, I think she's got that same sort of severity to her face. Shong, at least Hosanna, on the other hand, is a different colour from these two, and I noticed that this morning. He's much more golden, and that's quite unusual for her lineage. Her lineage is is generally fairly honey coloured. Can you see the resemblance with Shadow? There she looks up. Such a fat little belly. So that's very honey coloured and I think that the old Hosanna is a lot golder than that. And look at those feet. Those feet are almost the same size as her mother's. Now, Jandri and I was trying to work out this morning. We found some tracks of a leopard and I mean we were a little bit baffled as to whose they were and uh, well I mean in Jandri's case that's okay I'm I, however expected to know and uh, unfortunately I did not and having looked at her feet now they just look like a small female's tracks to me I think they were Shongilas they were just too little to be Karulas but you can see that her feet are almost the same size now as her mum's, and I think Shung, uh, Hosanna's are just slightly larger. Well done, Jandre. That's Jandre playing foot art. Now, Elana, you're 13 years old and you started watching last week, and it's wonderful to have you with us. And you want to know, when I'm reading leopard spots, am I reading from left to right? Or right to left, or their left to right, or our right to left, or how does it work? Now, this is a very, very good question. And what I'm going to do, I used to have a whole collection of little leopard diagrams in here, but unfortunately, I do not anymore. We are reading our left to right, so her right to left, okay? So if you're looking at... Karula, she's got three on her right, our left, so you read it like a book, and four on our right, her left. Make sense? So she's three, four. Right? Is that right? No, she's three on her right and four on her left. <laughs> but we read it from left to right as you would a book. That's the easiest way to remember it. Thank you, Jean-André. Jean-André is uh, giving me the thumbs up. That's very unusual as well. Some lovely sounds of the summer. The grasshopper going thick, 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 thick. In fact, that's probably a cicada. One or two chin spot battis. Catherine, you possibly also a new viewer. That's wonderful to have you with us. You say, um, <laughs> are there many leopards in this area and do they live together? Um, there are quite a few leopards in this area. It's one of the highest concentrations of leopards you probably find in Africa, which and therefore anywhere in the world. And so, yes, there are lots, but no, they're completely solitary. And the only time you see leopards together, there'd be two reasons. One, a male and a female will have decided that they like each other quite a lot and they'll be mating. And the other reason would be if you happen to find a mother and her cubs like this, and until they go independent, then they will be around with mum. Uh, female, probably till she's about, probably till she's about 16 months old, maybe a bit shorter, quite often a bit shorter, and the male till he's about two years old. Mmm, very nice. Look at her. So uncomfortable that she has to just put her foot up there. It's a bit like you after your enormous, enormous Sunday lunch, and then you just have to put your feet up on the sofa for a while. Now, Brent Leo Smith is hailing me on the blower. Let me attempt to get hold of him. For our new viewers, Brent Leo Smith, of course, another guide here. He's driving around some, well, dare we say, dignitaries from a National Geographic who are here to visit us. So I'm just going to tell him where the sighting is. Go ahead. One must be quite firm with him, of course. A 
Brent Lear Smith, go ahead. Go ahead. He wants to know which way to come, how to come. Brent Lear Smith, I think your best approach is going to be to come from the probably from the eastern side western side of the drainage there's not much space in here especially for two cars i'm in the drainage line if you come around to the western side i think that's going to be your best approach and there we are Isn't this is wonderful it's the most peaceful thing to be doing on a saturday afternoon it is Saturday, isn't it, Chandra? Right, these leopards aren't going anywhere. Byron, however, has got something that might very shortly, so let's go and find out what it is. Sorry, Anna. And we do have a beautiful bird of prey up in this tree, not too far from us. I wonder if some of you at home can tell me what this bird is. I'm going to sit here a while, I'm going to give you a minute uh, to try and get your answers in quickly. Um, I don't think it's going to fly. So have a look at it, tell me what you think, and then I shall reveal the answer. A beautiful bird of prey. It's a tricky one, it's not that easy. Um, but I, I don't want to give you too many clues yet. Um, we've still just been moving around, scanning for um, animal activity. I did see something very interesting, but just a brief glimpse. A pair of Steenbok, which were just off to the side of the road, but they moved off. They are very shy antelope. But what was fascinating about them was uh, the female. She was heavily, heavily pregnant. And she's definitely about to give birth to a little Steenbok. And that would be incredible to see. I've never really seen, I think, once or twice I've seen a, a young Steenbok. Not a small one, not a newborn at all. I think they are really hidden when they're very, very young. And it was interesting to see. She's definitely, within the next day or two, I'm sure, she was very, very pregnant. And um, I'm sure she's going to give birth soon. And the male was with her, which was lovely. Lovely to see a pair. We do know that the Stenbrock generally stay in pairs and they are monogamous. However, um, if one had to die or something happened to it, then the other one would then look for a new partner. But they do stay in a territory together. And, uh, and they're made for life, which is wonderful. Very different to some of the other antelope. Now, I wonder if we have any answers yet on the bird quiz. Now, Diane, you say a brown snake eagle. Um, unfortunately not, and uh, now it is tricky, and I'll tell you why. So Diane, you're not, you're not, you're on the right track, but um, if you look, when you identify these birds of prey, if you have a look, um, this eagle doesn't have feathers all the way down the legs, so it's known as not being a true eagle. True eagles have feathers all the way down the legs, but a brown snake eagle doesn't, so you're on the right track there. Also, by the coloration and that very, very close, However, a brown snake eagle has a very, very yellow eye, yellow ring around the eye, very easily, or, or you can see it very, very easily. Um, Aaron, you say a batelier, and that is correct. It is a immature or juvenile batelier eagle, and has not got the, um, the adult plumage just yet, or that beautiful black and white and that red face. This is a juvenile batelier perched up there, I think trying to get out of the heat, and that's why it's sitting in the shade of the tree. Lovely to see. And Valeria, you also got that right. Well done, well done. It's good that you're all trying and uh, having a good look, but they are tricky to identify at times. We're going to continue. I'm going to head towards Biffleshook Dam. As I said, it's very hot. Hopefully, I get some animals going down to drink. While I do that, let's head back to Jamie, who's out on a bushwalk. 
Now come and have a look at one of the biggest leopard tortoises that I've seen in this area and also one of the luckiest ones. Hello buddy. It's okay. I'm not sure if it's a male or a female. I think it's actually a female judging by the short length of the tail that I can just see tucked underneath the shell. Now, the reason that she is a very lucky tortoise is, first of all, she's, aid she's made it to a great age. I mean, this tortoise is, I'm not, I've spoken before about this, I'm no expert at aging tortoises, but she's probably a good few decades old. This is a big leopard tortoise. They don't get all that much bigger than that. But, have a look. It's okay, girl. Shame it's alright. Have a look here. And the scarring on and the denting and the misshapenness of her shell. At some point she has had a very lucky escape. Whether it was from something like a hyena, which is likely, or maybe a lion, or maybe a bird, although that is relatively unusual. Oh shame girl. I do love tortoises. It's alright. It's okay. Either way, at some point, she has had a very, very fortunate escape, and that's left her with a massive scar across her shell. And of course, her shell is made from bone. Her ribs and her spine is fused to the top of it, which means that that would have been quite an uncomfortable, quite a painful injury. Um, and that's left, and she's actually very, very lucky to have survived, because the depth of that, to me, looks like it might even have broken through, right through this to the skin below, to the flesh below. So our tortoise is one very, very fortunate girl. Obviously we're not going to be picking her up, it's alright girl, it's amazing how fast they can move when they want to, but now she's actually found herself a nice, slightly more comfortable position underneath a fallen log. And it's amazing how fast little tortoises can actually motor when they want to. I don't want to, I don't really want to scare her, ideally I'd go around that side, but I think she is a little bit frightened of us, and it's, it, the older tortoises tend to be more wary of humans. The little babies, like the one you've seen with Steph and myself, they're much more trusting. They're a great deal more relaxed with people than the older tortoises are. But for a leopard tortoise that could live up to 70 or so years old, this one has obtained pretty much close to her full life expectancy. She's an old girl. And tortoises, leopard tortoises, like all tortoises, grow very, very slowly. But this is the biggest species of tortoise that we get. Our lovely little lady, big lady, just going around to the front. Hello, girl. You are beautiful. And one of my absolute favorite things, I do love a good tortoise sighting. They're fascinating. One of the reptiles with almost proper eyelids, which you'll have a chance to see. You can actually see her face a little bit better through here. If we have a look closely at her eye, you can see her blinking. And you can see the really hardened scales around her legs and her feet. There she goes. We're going to just let her slowly but surely move off. This is a grandmother tortoise, and she's earned the right to a little bit of space. Hey, girl. Look at you go. The reason that I think it's a girl and not a boy tortoise is just the length of her tail, the fact that we can't really see it. It is tucked under. We can't really see it protruding from the shell. Male tortoises have slightly longer tails than females. And bye-bye, girl. Off she goes, looking to find some dense vegetation and maybe even a little bit of water to drink. It's one of the few, apart from being the longest-lived tortoise in the area, um, they're also one of the few left tortoises that can swim. The only tortoise that can swim. Oh, goodness. Brr, got up too fast. The world just did a little bit of a tilt. But yes, the only, leopard, the only tortoise species that we get out here that can actually swim. I'm not going to follow her anymore, because she definitely wants to get away from us. So I think that at her age, at her grand old age, if we just give her a little bit of space, I'm sure she'll be a great deal more comfortable if we back off a little bit. Shame. And of course, tortoises, when they are panicked, usually when you pick them up, they release the water that they've stored inside their bodies in, from a, something known as a bursa which is a, basically like a modified bladder. And especially as a female, she could be pregnant, she might actually need that water to lay her eggs. Good, absolutely. 
very good, very good question from Liz and Debbie. Um, and since Jandre's fall, I'm now relatively cautious about watching where the cameraman is about to walk. Don't want VM to fall over. You are absolutely right, Liz and Debbie. It could well have been a ground hornbill that caused that injury. Probably when the tortoise was a little bit smaller, that would most likely be when that would have occurred. Just in terms of the size of that tortoise, that uh, even a ground hornbill, which is a big, big bird, would have had a struggle even getting its claws around or perhaps its mouth around that particular that particular tortoise but when it was little when she was little when she was a tiny little thing then that might have been when she obtained that injury it's amazing how resilient they are that she managed to actually recover from that and I apologize by the way for the ink that is all over my hands I am um, I had a minor incident with a stamp we we need stamps to get out of the gate here and I tried to stamp somebody's exit stamp and promptly sprayed ink everywhere. Might be a nice spot, Viam, don't you think? On a day like today. Except that it smells. It actually smells quite terrible. Now if I were a warthog or a buffalo, I would go and plant myself right in the middle of this and have a jolly good wallow. And in fact, since I forgot to put sunblock on this afternoon, a decision which I am most annoyed with myself, not a decision, a mistake, which I'm most annoyed with myself, would probably work very well as a type of sunscreen. I'm not quite brave enough though. I don't really want to go and climb and rub into this mud. It's, it's very stinky, especially because there have been lots of hippo and lots of buffalo that will have spent time in here. Mm, that's very squidgy. This, this could go, could end badly. There we go. I'm just checking to see whether or not there's any tracks, interesting tracks to show you. Perhaps a tortoise has come for a swim or perhaps a warthog has come for a wallow. But it doesn't look that way. I think what we're going to do is carry on in search of some more shade and places to cool off. Let's go over to Byron and find out what his plan is from here on out. So, well, Jamie looks for some shade. We're still out driving, having a look, well, heading towards um, Buffles Hook Dam. And um, I'm sure it's very hot out on the walk. I mean, we got this cool breeze while we're driving, but it's still very, very warm. Let us go down here, Brian. I saw a quick flash of a bird earlier that looked like looked like perhaps the Eurasian golden oriole. Now we used to see the black-headed oriole, which is a beautiful, beautiful bird, and I'll show you a picture quickly of them. Let me find some shade quickly so you can see it a bit better. I'm also going to try to just stop and listen out. See if we can't hear any elephants, perhaps. Uh, I know there were some elephant on the Vuitella earlier. Um, Alright, so this is the black-headed oriole, which we are all used to seeing. That is the beautiful bird that we see quite regularly, and we hear it a lot here in this area. I'll just show you some pictures of it. Um, they're a beautiful, beautiful bird. Golden yellow with that black head, um, very easily or easy to identify. Then we've got, oh, don't worry, <laughs> too soon to panic. Um, the Eurasian golden oriole, which is a migratory species of oriole, but do you notice it hasn't got that um, black head at all? It's got some black on the wings, a lot more black on the wings, but golden color yellow golden yellow but no black on the head and I thought I caught a glimpse of this flying past but very very secretive sorry I thought I saw something or heard something move hang on a second I think I've got a little stowaway now what is it I hope it's nothing nothing uh, oh have a look here. Hang on. Oh. <laughs> Give me a second. 
and try to save this guy. You're playing hard to get now, aren't you? There we go. Hello. Stow away. Hang on, hang on. Let's just, let's just try to show you to everyone. So I'm getting caught in wires and trying to catch the dung beetle. Stay there for a second. Here we go. Look at that. Isn't he beautiful? Look how quickly... So I don't want to hurt him, but look how quickly he flicks himself back up. Look at that. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> okay, come. I'll put you off. <laughs> There we go, off you go. <laughs> and there he is, no, he's moving back towards the vehicle again. <laughs> but what a tenacious little dung beetle. Um, I mean, how, they're so powerful, it's hard to explain. But you can really feel them pushing and kicking the legs when they are moving around. Um, <laughs> nice to see him. And um, But how quickly could he just flip back off of his back? Just a quick little flip and back on his feet and off he goes again. Um, so he was catching a little ride with us. That was a fairly large dung beetle. And perhaps a little camera shy. Oh, I just caught a glimpse of a roller flying past. Uh, lilac breasted roller and I've spotted him uh, Brian I wonder if you at the top of that tree if you can I don't know what the light is like for you through the back a dead tree you might be able to see it through there there we go let's see if we can see it see the light it's very very difficult at the moment because it's so bright yeah even with the camera's settings, it still makes it very difficult to make out. Yeah, but it is a lilac-breasted roller. Oh dear. Um, this morning we got a question about um, the mail lines. Somebody wanted to see the mail lines and was hoping we'd see one or two of those, uh, the, the other males that are part of the Birmingham Coalition that we haven't seen for quite some time. We saw one the other day. He was here with the two brothers, Ntinu and Mfumo. But um, it sounds like two, two males are north of our boundary on Biffle's Hook. Someone else found them this morning and I just heard they drove past them about 10 minutes ago. They're still in that same area. So they're quite far from the Unkahuma Pride. Uh, probably a few kilometers, so three or four miles apart as the crow flies. So completely different area to where they are. But maybe they meet up during the course of the evening, you never know. Okay, we fairly close to Biffleshook Dam. I think. <laughs> Just hopefully I haven't got my direction lost completely. I haven't seen any sign of elephant tracks or anything yet while we're driving along, but, uh, but you never know. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we arrived at the dam and there's a herd of elephant drinking and splashing water and mud on themselves? That would be great. And we're almost there. This buffalo carcass just off to the right over here is not smelling particularly good at all. That's an old carcass. Not much left. Oof, sure. Especially in this heat. Not a nice smell at all. All right, let's have a look. we at the dam. And have we got any elephants? 
No, it doesn't look like it at all. Uh, Jerry, me. I'm just having a look around and uh, no sign of any animals here, which is strange. It is strange, but it happens like that sometimes. Um, what I might do is I might change and try head down towards the drainage lines where it's a lot cooler. Maybe we get some animals moving through there. But um, the other reason why I wanted to have a look is to see if the elephant have come through. I'd probably see where they'd splashed water out and on the banks around the water, the water hole or the dam. There's no sign of any activity here at all. So. Perhaps they're still moving through the thickets feeding. Let's see if we can find them. I know they were at Juma Dam earlier today. So maybe we're lucky and we can still find them. Um, while I do that, James is still with that female leopard. Let's go and have a look. Yeah, I know. Now, there has been very little activity since you left us last. Karula actually just did get up and said hello to Shungile before going back to sleep just behind where we are now. So we'll give you a view of her just shortly. But they haven't gone to eat. And I think they've done a huge amount of uh, eating in the last few days. I don't think that Karula was hungry when she killed that impala especially given how we saw Hosanna. If you weren't with us on drive this morning we saw little Hosanna and he looked very satiated indeed. He didn't look in the slightest bit hungry. So I think they've probably come off a kill towards this area. And I think that's why they're not looking particularly enthusiastic about the meal their mother has prepared for them. And I say them, but Hosanna is not here right now. We'll try and find him a little bit later on. Can you see Karula Jandri? There she is. Jandra is not very happy because it's not the best picture in the world. He gets very upset if the picture isn't very nice, you see. He's an artiste. Now, I think what we're going to do, everyone, I have said this a little bit earlier, but I think we'll sit here for another 10 minutes, then we'll head down and see if we can't find uh, Hosanna. And then we'll come back here a little bit later. I'm kind of missing this name here. I think it's Padsley. Is it Padsley in Four Ways Johannesburg? Paz. P A S Lee. Pasley. Pasley. Uh, that's an interesting name. You say, will her um, will her territory stay the same her whole life, or might she move? It does stay pretty much the same, Pasley. It will expand and contract on either side, you know, north, south, east, or west, slightly, dependent on pressure from other leopards. So she's got, she'll have a core area which will remain pretty much unchanged. And then let's say the, I'd say uh, about a fifth, if you take a radius of a circle and about a fifth on the outside will expand and contract depending on pressure from leopards that are living around her territory. But she would never sort of move completely. I'm sure leopards have done it. They've, just about every kind of phenomena you can think of has happened in biology. But I think you'll probably find that it's extremely rare for a leopard to move completely from her territory. That's another safari vehicle there, being driven by the inimitable Brent Leo Smythe. Now, for those of you also who haven't been watching of late, Shongila has made two kills so far, on her own completely. Both of them, as far as we know, squirrels. I mean, she may well have made many others while we haven't been watching. There we go, scrub hair on Arethusa, as Jandre says. Thank you, Jandre, for that. If you could say it slightly less um, acerbically next time, that would be great. He says he doesn't know what acerbic means. I'll educate him shortly. Um, and that's interesting because, of course, she will most likely go independent before him. Um, and so she's starting to kind of sort herself out. But interestingly, he was on his own today. He didn't look uncomfortable at all. And yeah, they're both, I guess, starting to assert some form of independence at this stage. It's very early for a male to be on his own. 
but not unusual for him to be on his own for a day or two. Christine and Kathy Yar, nice question from you about whether or not leopards can have green eyes or multicolored eyes or you know what kind of eyes they have. Sometimes they maintain blue, but normally it's the kind of color that uh, she's actually got quite brown eyes. Hers are unusually brown, but her brothers and mothers are the most common leopard color. It's a kind of greeny, it's a greeny color. I wouldn't know, I mean, how would you describe it, John? There's a kind of pale lime green, I suppose. Um, it's actually a, it's it's almost like a honeyed yellow green if you like it's not it's not very striking hers are strikingly brown and the mvula for example one of the males who we used to see quite frequently his eyes are uh, pretty much blue and interestingly while i talk about mvula of course he his territory has shifted and it's shifted almost um I wouldn't say completely out of where it was before, but it certainly contracted hugely, uh, probably because of pressure. <laughs> this is a famous trait of the Queen, everybody. She likes to stick her tongue out. It's not very royal, is it, John Ray? Stick your tongue out like that. Long whiskers. Nobody's entirely sure what whiskers are for. Here comes the leopard. Come, Tronry. The little one's coming towards us. She likes the look of Jandre, you see. He's got quite a lot of flesh on his legs, and I think maybe she's looking at him thinking, hmm, I wonder if that tastes like chicken. I am, of course, talking absolute rubbish. Uh, both on the... I don't think Jandre's legs would taste like chicken at all, but she's also not looking at him for any other reason. Then she's a little bit bored, she's a little bit uncomfortable because her stomach's so full and she's hot. And so they just a bit like us tossing and turning when we're in bed and hot and uncomfortable. That's what she's doing. But she's now so close that I actually can't see her. I can only see her in the monitor that I'm looking at. Now, Tucker, you're just four years old. Hello, boy. I hope you're having a good time on safari with us today. You want to know if the mum is cross that her little boy, Hosanna, has not bothered to stay with her, that he's run away. Tucker, he hasn't run away. He's just down. He's actually not too far from here. He's just a little bit lost, and he's getting older now. I know that he seems very young, but he's basically like a human being who's, say, I don't know, say 13 years old. So he's just starting to be okay. It's like he's going shopping on his own or maybe riding his bicycle to school on his own. So no, his mum's not cross with him at all. She'll be happy to see him again, I'm sure, but she's not cross with him. All right, let's head back across to Jamie. She's on foot. I don't know what she's got. Let's go and find out. Well, I have no doubt that very shortly Hosanna will make his way back to mom or perhaps even mom will go and find him. In the meantime, speaking of finding things, have a look at this incredible black and white jumping spider that VM has found for us. I, he left, so we need to go to the end. We need to go to the end. There he is. Oh, sorry, yes. Um, <laughs> sorry, Viam. Viam thought our jumping spider had disappeared, um, but he is in fact still there, and he is in fact still fascinating looking, and I'm a bit more concerned about the spider vanishing than the, than the stick insects. The stick insects have a tendency to stay. Um, jumping spiders do not. And isn't this little one beautiful? There are so many different types of jumping spiders, but you can actually really see the detail in their faces, and I always feel like they're one of the most mischievous looking spiders. They always look like they're up to trouble, up to something no good. And watch the jump. He might actually jump now. He looks like he's thinking about it. You can see he's weighing up his options. And it's absolutely astounding the way in which they power themselves forward. Oh, no, he's just hiding now. What are you going to do if I do that? Oops, sorry, Viam. There we go. He should be called a zebra jumping. There we go. One hop. So active little hunters. He's on the lookout for food. I'm oh, not food. <laughs> that was very funny. He jumped on me and then decided, actually, I really, really don't want to be on that thing. And he jumped off again. I've uh, mentioned a stick insect at the start. And the stick insect, I'm less worried about it disappearing. 
they are always incredible. The ability of these creatures to camouflage themselves is absolutely breathtaking. And this particular one is beautifully designed. In fact, all of them will do this. He looks at the moment as though he's got four legs, and that's because two of his legs are actually stretched out in front of his body, in front of his head, to even better to sort of carry on the facade of being a stick. I don't remember any of you, I don't know if any of you remember Steve the Stick Insect that we had on Cheetah Plains. He was a much, much larger version of this particular stick insect. They're fascinating little creatures, they really are. I mean, they really, from a distance, unless you happen to be sitting right up close, which is what I was doing, so I was looking at the jumping spider, and unless you happen to be looking right up close, you would never ever know that they're there. And how birds manage to spot them, I just don't know. I was about to grab the jumping spider because it was on a stick, but it's just jumped off again. Bear with me one moment. I'm going to try and catch it. Not catch it, I just want to try and get it up close to the camera without it jumping away, which might actually prove to be next to impossible. Here, don't you want to jump onto that? There, look, see? There, you want to jump onto that. I'm sure you do. There you go. See, I told you you wanted to jump onto that. Okay, this could end very interestingly. Right, at any second now, he is going to jettison off this piece of bark and vanish. But it just does give us a really nice opportunity to examine him up close and personally. With their bright eyes. Am I holding him still enough for you, Viam? Yes. Cool. Oh, where are you going? You're going into my hand. No, no. Already been there, don't want to stay there. There he goes, now he's going to go into my thumb. See what I mean about the mischievous eyes? You will have had a brief view of them there. They're actually quite beautiful spiders, and this is a particularly beautiful one. They are, they've got adorable faces. They've also got quite, quite sharp and quite powerful chelicera. In other words, the biting parts. But I'm just going to pretend that I'm a part of this bark and hopefully he decides not to bite me. If he does, I'll survive. He uh, walks in stop motion. Yes. Like a little robot. Mm. That is so cool. It's actually quite, oh my word, it's actually quite disconcerting. Once you notice it, you can't unsee it. And now what? Now where are we going? Hmm? You can't disappear in amongst the freckles, buddy. Where are you going to go? <laughs> Shame. They're cute, aren't they? They're jumping spiders you can actually really learn to love. If you look at them in the face, right in the face, they've got such adorable expressions. Now he's looking at Viam, looking to see where he can jump to next. <laughs> Cat in Tampa says that jumping spiders are one of the reasons that she has a trust issues. <laughs> I hear you, cat. I hear you. He's about to jump straight into my face. I can just feel it. He's looking at my face. He's looking at me in the eye. And he's actually testing my nerve here. I'm going to slowly turn him so that he'll go back onto the piece of bark, or hopefully he does. <laughs> Trust issues. I know exactly what you mean, though, because they do look like small innocuous spiders until they launch themselves straight at you. And you get huge ones. You get ones that are at least double this chap's size. And you get tiny ones as well. We saw a tiny one on Mork this morning. But this is the prettiest, I think this is the prettiest jumping spider I've ever seen. With his beautiful zebra black and white. He's very attractive. Aren't you? Yes, it's about to jump into the camera. That's what it feels like. I actually think he's really thinking about it. He's gathering himself. Looking up at the camera. I'm desperately trying to stay still, which gets harder the more you think about it. Is he going to jump? Is he going to jump? Okay, let me pop him down before he does actually launch himself onto the camera itself. Hey buddy. Alrighty, thank you. Thank you. You can go. There we go. Bye bye. And off he goes. The joys of jumping spiders and stick insects and other such things. And the whole time we've been there with our, with our jumping spider, Sticky the stick insect hasn't moved at all. Here we go, Sticky. You can stay there. But he's gone. Our little jumping spider's decided he's had enough of these weird people, and he's off. Now, somewhere here, 
He was a grasshopper, but it has vanished. Unless I'm blind, which is entirely possible because they are so camouflaged, but I think I'm blind. He's... no, I think he's gone. Oh well. We've had enough jumping things for one segment, I think. Um, I've had enough of trying to keep my hands still whilst spiders are jumping all over them. Anything else? No. It's amazing what you see. The longer you stay somewhere, the longer you stay in one spot, the more you actually find, whether it's the jumping spider and the stick insect, which Viam spotted, actually, um, right down to the antline holes that are spread out throughout this area. Oh, this one's actually got an antline in it. Oh, what is that? What on earth is that? See? See what I mean about staying in one spot? That is utterly bizarre. Wait, stop. What are you? What on earth is that? It's a spider with a... I think I've seen the spider before. I'm pretty sure it is actually a spider. Now that I can see its legs. No, oh, wait, wait. I just want to look at you. I have no idea. That is so cool. It looks like he's gathered up. Wait, just stop for a second. Stop moving! Please. Okay, if it is a spider, it's missing a... L it's got six legs. Maybe it is a spider. It's some kind of insect. Sorry to be really unhelpful there. It is some kind of insect that's gathered bits of dirt and bark on top of it. And I have seen one of these now that I think about it. But isn't that just genius camouflage? You saw the stick insect earlier. And now we've got this thing. This fascinating thing. It's not a spider. I don't think it's a spider. But it is a something. It's got long furry legs. Either that or its legs are covered in dirt. Long antenna. And it's got the most amazing camouflage. I can't quite work out if that's genuine bark and dirt or if it's if it's growth if it's grown like that. Excuse me, can you come back here for a second? You're fascinating me. Its legs are all furry, but they're covered in dirt. And it looks as though it's got grass seeds on it, but it definitely only has six legs. So unless it's a very unfortunate spider, which is also possible, I don't think it's a spider. <laughs> that is so cool. <laughs> it's coming for you, Vim. Uh, Aaron, you wanted to know what is my favorite time of year to do a bushwalk. It's a difficult one, Aaron. Um, it depends on what, I, what it is I'm after. The bushwalks that I used to do, this is, learning to do these sorts of bushwalks for our safari live has been a different experience because it's not the walks that I used to do. We used to mission for six hours at a time, have a specific destination or a specific animal in mind to track and then carry on from there. So this has been a different experience. So for me, um, probably one of my favorite times to walk would have been in perhaps late summer or even actually um, early spring because then the temperatures weren't too hot and we could walk far but there'd still be a little bit of water in the river so not right in the middle of the dry season but now I'm actually feeling like midsummer and just after the rains is one of my favorite things because with this camera you can see more than perhaps you'd stop and see with the normally while you were walking through the bush and that I really enjoy. It's also nice, I have to be honest, at the moment walking around because it does feel like with the rain it's just taken an edge off the animals here. I've been feeling a little bit like everything is very on edge, very, it's particularly buffalo and elephant. It's just an hippo of course and the hippo are still struggling and the buffalo are still thin but it doesn't feel quite so pressurized. This place is starting to feel a little bit like a pressure cooker in terms of the drought and there were just buffalo around every corner and it's it's nice walking now. It's very comfortable. It's very warm though. So I'm not sure. It's a difficult one. There's more bugs around in summer in the rainy season. Right, I am now thoroughly dirty. So I'm going to do some sweeping of myself to get rid of all of the the dirt that I've gathered lest I start looking like that insect. In the meantime let's go and find something that I think would dearly like to eat it. And look at that beautiful view of the green wood hoopoo. Oh that is wonderful. That very very 
bright red beak. I'm hoping the sun hits it, you'll see the beautiful iridescence on the body. It seems to be it's typical wood hoopoo behavior, jumping around looking for insects. Let's just see where it decides to go. Come on, jump into the light for us. Now, there are a few of them around. Uh, some have just flown off. This one's still just hanging around on the tree. It's gone a little bit lower, Brian, I think. There it is. Um, and they are uh, communal birds. Uh, you always find a group of them together. They're very gregarious, always in, in little groups. See if the others are around. I'm just scanning. I can't see the others at the moment. But they are beautiful birds, and it's not often you get to see one sitting and jumping around a tree like this. Often fly quite quickly. Now the interesting thing with these birds is they do something known as allomimetic calling. And oh, there it goes. It's flown off. Now the allomimetic calling is basically group calling. So when these birds start calling, I'm trying to see if I can't see any others. Really can't. It's strange. There should be a few others around. But when one starts calling, they all call together as a group. And you get this chorus between all these birds together calling. It's called allomimetic calling. It's group calling. It's social behavior that they do. Now the green wood hoopoo do it. Uh, what else do it? Uh, some of the um, uh, the helmet trikes, the helmet trikes do it. The su southern white crowned helmet trike and the uh, retzer's helmet trike, they do it. Another bird that does it. Um, arrow marked babblers, that's a good one. I'm sure you would have all heard them. They all, when they fly together, they all call together. It's all that allomimetic calling. Now, we have had a fairly, hang on a second, I can just hear a bird alarm calling, sounds like a starling, I just want to have a look quickly, see what it's calling, perhaps a snake, it could also be a mongoose. Hold on, where is it now? Can't see it. It was a little bit far from us. Hold on. Oh. Sorry, it's behind us a little bit. Let's just have a look here, because when, usually when these birds call like this, oh, and it's mobbing something there. You know what? I'm gonna go have a look. Hold on. You know what? It's going very quickly. I think it's. Possibly just a mongoose. Let's just double check. There it is. Under the tree, it's a slender mongoose. Oh, just running off. Can you see it there, Brian? Did you get a glimpse? A little slender mongoose. Where did they? Oh, just across the cave. It's so quick, unfortunately. Uh, but that's what it was. So as I said, it could be a snake or a mongoose. It was a mongoose. I just wanted to double check for you quickly. Um, and that slender mongoose, the reason that bird would be alarm calling at it and uh, and um, and trying to mob it and chase it away is the mongoose may try and feed on eggs or little chicks if it does come across any of those. So that's why the birds will mob it and try to chase it away. Uh, into the, but so quick, very very shy little creature, so quick. But if it was a snake, we could have potentially had a lovely sighting of a snake. It's always great just to have a look, just to check. But it's amazing how birds can alert you to certain predators being around. Interesting little things that you can find in the bush. Now I've come back towards Juma Dam, Voyatella Dam, Galago Dam, it's, uh, it's all the same dam. And I just wanted to have a look around and see if there was anything.
close by and drinking around here. Uh, I wonder if these animals are not, if they know something we don't. <laughs> because we, we struggle to find little animals this afternoon. Now let's see if there are any interesting birds around here, perhaps. Uh, there's a terrapin out in the open. Um, to the left hand side there's a little island sticking into the water. And you'll see there's a terrapin basking in the sun. There he is, in the back. Now a terrapin is a freshwater turtle. The other difference is the um, terrapins are able to move their necks to the side and I don't think turtles can do that, if I'm not mistaken. So the, the terrapins actually, when they get disturbed, they tuck their heads in, but to the side. Also different to tortoises who pull their necks in to stay out, away from danger. So no sign of those elephants that were in this area earlier today. I don't know where they disappeared to. Perhaps they headed north out of Juma, out of Weatela. I think why don't we go and see if we can find the Unkahuma Pride. There's not much else going on at the moment this afternoon. Let's see, maybe they're still around. I'm hoping they haven't moved off. Perhaps they just moved down into the drainage line or just further into the shade. <coughs> Excuse me. birds around at the moment. You can hear a lot of birds. Woodland kingfishers are calling, the starlings are calling, um, some forktail drongos. There's a lot of sounds coming around or, or that we can hear around us. But just no sign of a lot of wildlife. We've seen the few impala and um, but not much else at, for the moment. Uh, there we go. There's some impala and some lambs off to our right. Hang on. Let me see if I can get us a nice view Hang through there, perhaps. Brian, how's that for you? There we go. And two little lambs. Oh, I love seeing them at the moment. It is a lovely time of year. <laughs> nice to see these little lambs with the females and there are just two of them here I'm surprised there aren't more and there may be a few more hiding in the thicket somewhere you can see they all move through the thickets trying to stay in a little bit of shade where they can stay cool and off they go Nice to see them. Lovely to see the Impala lambs. Uh, very, very cute. <laughs> uh, Alright, we are going to try to start the vehicle for one. <laughs> oh dear. Might need a, need a hand later. <laughs> Someone can come tow us. Alright, so we're going to head towards the last position of the Unkahuma prior to see if we can find them. While I do that, let's head back to James and get an update from him. <laughs> the reason I'm smiling, of course, is because I was singing Byron's Link, and you know, one loses concentration every so often. Oh, there's a diker. Do you see it, Jondry? Oh, it's running away. Beastly, beastly, beastly animal. 
Anyway, what we did was we went to look for Hosanna. We went on foot. Jamie is definitely in that area, and I'm not sure if she said that she was looking for him, but I suspect quite strongly, given her footprints and uh, those of Aubrey and uh, who was filming her? Viam. Uh, yes, I'm pretty sure they're looking for him as well. So we left the area, we wandered about it, but didn't find any tracks or signs. So we'll let him be, I think, for now. We're going to go down to Treehouse Dam. I think it's the only body of water that Byron hasn't checked. What have you spotted? Oh, well spotted, Andre. There's a road, everybody. It's having a dust bath. That's why its colours are so dull. Hello. Yes. Go on, as you were. Now he's looking for something to eat while he dust baths. Uh, he's eating stone. <laughs> That's probably going into his uh, gizzard. Isn't that cool? Is that a stone or is it a seed? No, I think it's a stone. So, I mean, a roller is ostensibly an insect-eating bird, and they will eat stones. It's not unusual for a bird to eat stones. They have a very muscular little pouch, sort of just below the throat, called a gizzard. And that muscular pouch yeah, sort of twists and turns, a bit like a washing machine, I suppose, but with stones. And what that does is crush up whatever they eat. And that's important if you don't have teeth, of course. And in the case of a roller, because it's an insect eater, by and large, it eats a huge amount of what we call chitin, which is the chemical that the exoskeleton of insects... <laughs> there it goes. It's, that's the chemical that the exoskeleton is made of. Mm, that's beautiful, Jandre. Um, was this uh, blurry safaris? Yes. Mm. Eggsy inspired. Um, anyway, so that, that gizzard chops up that indigestible chitin and then it obviously goes through the body. Isn't that cool? Oh, now there are two confessions I have to make. It's going to be very difficult for me, Jandre. The first confession is the following. Um, I was told in no uncertain terms on Twitter by some very kind viewer um, that I was speaking uh, an untruth of nonsense the other day when I was asked, is it only owls that are able to produce a pellet? Now, for those of you who don't know, owls produce pellets uh, when they swallow something whole and they spit up often sort of claws and keratin and hair from whatever they've eaten and they spit them down. And I was asked after we watched a kingfisher eating a scorpion whether they too produce pellets, to which I confidently asserted that no, only owls produce pellets because only they or very few other birds swallow their mammalian prey whole the rest of them chop it up and feed it so definitely only owls that produce pellets it turns out that um, owls herons kingfishers eagles kestrels um, I think some shrikes various other birds also produce pellets so in fact the question is more the better which birds do not produce pellets and uh, it would seem very few is the answer so that is my first confession <clears throat> my second confession is that uh, my sort of source of internet knowledge Judy H sent me a very a slightly more gentle tweet the other day and I've spoken consistently since I began here of the fact that elephants and human beings go through menopause uh, because of course of the, um, the important repositories of knowledge that older animals are uh, Judy found some article, a National Geographic article, very nice article, about the fact that elephants do not, in fact, go through menopause. They produce uh, babies until just about the day they die. The only animals that have menopause at all, human beings, orcas, so killer whales, and another species of pilot whale. Those are the only mammals that we know of that go through, look at that, that go through menopause. Isn't that gorgeous? Those are not orcas, or pilot whales, or indeed human beings. They are kudu, and they do not go through menopause, Jandre. No. That is wonderful. I'm just going to be quiet and just listen to the heat of the afternoon. It is hot. What I'd like you to try and hear is the flies buzzing. 
There's an oriole calling deep in the background. And just try and almost taste the heat. It's quite close, it's quite humid. And everything feels like it's quite hot. And slowly, the sound that you can hear now is going to ramp up as it cools. So I'd say in about half an hour, things will start to cool down. And then the birds will start to sing a bit more their final evening chorus. Andre and I have both looked suddenly to the left because there's a woodpecker pecking somewhere. We can hear it, but we cannot see it. It is going peck, 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 peck. It's here. Let's just sneak slowly forward. I'll stop talking as though I'm going trying to put you to sleep shortly. Now I suspect from the very quiet nature of the pecking that it is a cardinal woodpecker, our smallest woodpecker species. I think it's either on this small tree here or the one behind. Andre, do you still hear the gentle peck, peck, pecking of the woodpecker? You do? Negative. I don't either. All I hear is spider hunting wasps and heat. All right, we're close to Treehouse Dam. Let's go look there. Thank you Steve very much for your comment. I was postulating yesterday why it is that birds move their heads when, when they move and you said parallax is the answer which of course is well a sort of a way of describing the way a bird will because it's got eyes on the sides of its head it's not well a bird like the um, black-bellied bustard we were looking at yesterday has eyes on the sides of its head. It's moving to get depth of perception. Thank you for that Steve. Um, I have spotted a very, very elegant antelope through the midst of the trees there. Let's drive slightly up here and we'll have a look. There it is. Look at it. It's not even running away. Indeed, it seems quite chuffed to be on screen. There it is. It says hi, everybody. Next to it um, is a, something not quite as elegant. There we go. Um, something akin to... Oh, that's very nice. That is a, I'm not sure what that is actually, it looks like a sort of small yeti. Yes, it is a small yeti, and then to the left of that, ah, excellent, the dominant male, Aubrey. Right, let's head straight across to the elegant antelope there, who is giggling, of course, because she knows what I'm saying, doesn't she? Nod your head, that's it, nod your head, yes, there we go, uh-huh. <laughs> I'm having a jolly good chuckle at, at James's commentary. It's always highly entertaining. This is now the second time today that we have uh, bumped into James on the road. Bye-bye, Jean-Dre. Bye-bye, James. Bye-bye. Watch out for Treehouse Dam. <laughs> I can't believe he called Viam a small yeti. Viam, I'm going to stand for that. I don't think so. You're just going to park his car in for a week. Aha. I don't think he'd like that at all, and your car is much bigger than his. There we go. Sorted. Problem solved. The minor disputes between various team members <laughs> resolve themselves as, <laughs> as um, parking wars. And Aubrey James says apparently you're the, you're the alpha male of the group. <laughs>
<laughs> um, we're actually in the block north of Treehouse Dam. Now, I know that James mentioned the fact that we were looking for Hosanna. We're not actually actively looking for him, although I think there is a chance we could stumble into him at some point. The last tracks we had were this morning, uh, after we'd finished off with our dung beetle, which I think rounded off the rest of the afternoon, and his tracks were coming not quite in this direction, but roughly in this direction. So we did have we did have him moving about in this area. Brent says he was just chasing squirrels. I'm not sure what was happening with our lovely little Hosanna and why he was away from mom. I think he's going to be doing that more and more frequently. But I think there's a chance that we could actually bump into him. Although I still have yet to walk Karula's cubs on foot while they're away from mom. So it could be that he could be watching us this entire time and had just run away. Now Naomi, you wanted to know, and Naomi is from Pretoria, Naomi, you wanted to know whether or not if the two cubs separate from each other and they bump into each other months later, would they recognize each other? Yes, I think they would. Um, there's a lot of debate about how leopards recognize each other. I think every leopard in an area knows individuals, and I think especially with their siblings, and particularly in their first stages of life, they haven't quite established territories. They're not inclined to be as aggressive as they might otherwise. Of course, our leopards are very beautiful, but there are lots of very beautiful things out here. Let us head across to Byron and see what beautiful things he's found for you. And we've got the whole Unkuhuma pride, Jamie. Um, they have probably moved five meters from this morning, <laughs> so it wasn't too difficult to find them again, fortunately. And there is still a bit of shade around, I think that's why. And they've just stayed here. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five. All five females. And one, two, three, four, five. Where's the other cub? I'm trying to count now. Mm. Not sure exactly where they are. Uh, it's hard to see, I think. There's one lying there. One, two. Three, four, five. Where's the other one? Must be lying somewhere here. Maybe behind that other lioness that we just considered. Oh, beautiful woodland kingfisher again, right above us. And there it goes, just flown off as they usually do. Now there were there were two of them here earlier this morning. So I wonder if there isn't perhaps a nest or they are thinking of nesting in this tree. I see there are, there are some holes around here. What I would like to show you, and I think James showed it to you today. Well there's a little hole in the, in the trunk of that tree but look at that beautiful flower below it. And that is of course the leopard orchid. Beautiful leopard orchid. So I wonder if we can try to get a bit closer on those flowers, Brian, is it possible? You get uh, yellow with those brown spots, that is, wow, that's amazing, look at that. Isn't that magnificent, the beautiful leopard orchid. Ancilia africana, that's the scientific name of the leopard orchid. So we have a leopard, orchid, and lions. <laughs> ah, that joke never gets old. <laughs> oh, there's a little yawn from that cub. Oh, look at them. Oh, that's, that's the other cub is in there too. I just saw it now. So they're all six cubs yep. uh, All six cubs and uh, all five lionesses, which is great. Nice to see the whole family back together. It seems as if they are having a very lazy Saturday. And um, I always, I, I tend to forget what day it is out here. Um, but uh, James had to 
shoot into town quickly today so that's how we knew it was Saturday because he told us so <laughs> but we do forget we do lose track of days out here but that's that's the wonderful thing about being in the bush I suppose we've got some visitors at the moment too that um, and I'm doing a bit of work in the area and um, it's great to have uh, some people coming in and, and staying, they're actually staying in Voyatella at the moment um, and they are going on game drives with, well James and, and Brent have taken them out already which is nice. So they're getting a feel for what Safari Live is all about, what we do out here and getting to go on game drives and viewing all the animals that we have in the area which is great. It's nice to, have, as I said, nice to just have some company around. We get to chat about different things and uh, um, and have a few people. Just a change of scenery, I suppose. For us, not that uh, it's not great in the DRC. Um, we do have a lot of fun there, but uh, but it is nice to have other people around. And we had dinner last night at Fuyatela, which was lovely. Beautiful view from the deck, obviously, of the Juma waterhole or the Vuyatela waterhole. You can hear the woodland kingfishers back. He's sitting, where is he? I can't see him now. This is a very peaceful scene indeed. I'm sure those of you who are watching are just enjoying um, watching these lions rest and you know, the flick of the tail keeping the flies away, some of the cubs, one or two of the cubs cleaning themselves, lion is rolling over. <laughs> it's lovely, it's, it's very very nice and uh, you know I do think it's, it's just so such a fortunate sighting to be able to sit so close to these wild animals and and for them to allow us here really is is just a, a great experience and it's so peaceful as we said the birds calling in the distance there's um, some nice shade around and <laughs> look have a look this lioness is off to the right her paws she's managed to put a paw in the tree <laughs> she's resting it on the branch <laughs> oh, look at that So it's almost as if these lions know that it's the weekend and that they need to they need to rest. They've had a long week, <laughs> long week at the, in the office, <laughs> trying to find food. Oh, you know, it, it, it's funny. I'm just watching this little cub off to the left. Um, he's just rolling. Hang on, there it goes, just rolled onto his back and then off to the side again, that little one. Now I was watching that little one um, and it was, its leg was twitching a little bit. Now, I wonder, I do sometimes wonder, do, do they dream? Do they dream of chasing antelope or, or chasing one another? Because you see them, sometimes the legs twitch a little bit, but, but I'm not sure. I mean, I really don't know. And how would we know? Maybe it is just uh, just muscles twitching. Um. I think we're going to sit with these lines a little bit longer just in case they... Oh, 
the woodland kingfisher agrees with me. Sit and just spend some time here. Um, now, why don't we go back to J.R.H. Hendry, and uh, you know that stands for James Reginald Humphrey. Let's see what he has got. <laughs> Myron, of course, is the least funny human being in the world, as you've just noticed. Uh, there is a little couple of Egyptian gooses and their little goslings. They've got eight of them, hopefully slightly more competent parents than the ones at Biffles Hook Dam, who are the worst parents in the Sabi Sand. Aren't they sweet? Oh, that's just wonderful. Now, they're coloured like that, I suspect, because if you put them in a little bit of shade, they're probably are rendered almost completely invisible. They're already very good swimmers, and I suspect they're probably no more than a day or two old. Isn't that cool? I don't know if that's mum or dad, it's almost impossible to tell the difference, but they are both very attentive parents, and they both make equal effort. Look at them climbing over those things, jumping up and down, completely sure-footed. So cool. And they'll be eating bits of algae, basically. That's all they're eating at the moment. <coughs> excuse me, excuse me, everybody. I'm there, sorry. I must have blown a couple of speakers. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Oh, look at them walking. A little bit like me when I walk, don't they, Chandra? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm quite duck footed myself. And an Egyptian goose, of course, puts its nest in a tree. So these things, no, they must be much more than a day or two old. That's nice when mum just stands on you, eh? That's beautiful. Now, 